Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for taking the time to participate today. I wanted to talk about getting kids outside, bringing kids into the garden. And my name is Susan DeBleek. I coordinate the Master Gardener program for the state of Iowa. So today I want to talk about why we should get kids outdoors, what some ways are that we can cultivate the outdoor play, what are some ways that we could engage youth in the process, and what are some specific ways that Master Gardener volunteers can help. So just a little bit about me. I've done uh, a few different types of outdoor education. I had the opportunity of hiking, swimming, and exploring with kids through a day camp in Acadia National Park. And later I created a cooking, gardening, and farming program for teenagers. And this provided them hands-on experiences to learn about food and learn about agriculture and get dirty. And I'm also a parent now. And so I'm trying to get my child outdoors, even though they're young. And I'm really interested in this topic of getting children outdoors because I'm a school garden promoter, I'm a parent, and I'm an outdoor enthusiast. I also try to spend more time outdoors. And one other thing about me that might be similar to you is that when I was a young child, we had a large property that was nearby woods and really close to a lake. There were no fences. We got to go wherever we wanted to go and explore. And then when I was about 10 years old, we moved closer to the city and it was a lot harder to find ways to get outdoors. And that's really what's been happening in the US and worldwide with urbanization. And so it'll be interesting to, to learn from you all how you're trying to get back connected to nature if you have moved to a more urban area. A few of the resources that I'm gonna call on today, one is this fantastic book called Balanced and Barefoot by Angela Hanscom. I really enjoy that one. And she draws on work by Richard Louvre, which is called The Last Child in the Woods. So these are some books that I'm gonna call on today. And then another really fantastic resource is called the Natural Learning Initiative. And it's a program at North Carolina State University. And it's focused on redesigning daycare play areas to increase play, increase outdoor play, and then also reduce obesity. And it's a really cool project that I'll share a little bit about and hopefully you can look into in other ways. So the first question is why should kids play outside? For me, when I was a young child, it was just a normal thing that, that I did. Um, but maybe you've noticed this too, that the amount of time that we spend outdoors decreases every generation. And then also the distance that we're allowed to go without an adult also decreases over time. So I want to just jump into why, why is it that kids should go outdoors? So one thing that Angela Hanscom talks about in her book is how we as a society are limiting children's movement. Kids get lots of screen time, whether it's at school with an iPad or a computer, whether it's at home with a TV, she says that kids are getting five plus hours per day. Some other people say seven hours per day. We've also decreased recess time. So recess used to be an hour and it's been decreased down to 25 minutes or sometimes it's non-existent in some schools. And then we do have outdoor activities for kids, but they're highly structured. And Angela Hanscom says that it's really different for a kid to be playing soccer with rules and coaches than it is for a group of kids just to be out building a fort and deciding what they want to do on their own. 
And so kids these days spend a third less time playing outside than their parents did. That's a, according to the Center for Disease Control. And this, this might be part of the reason why kids are getting outside less. So one of the things about playing outdoors is that it's key to healthy child development. And I just wanted to give you a few examples of how playing outdoors supports healthy development. So there was a recent article in The Guardian, and it was about a University College of London study that found that kids had an increased self-worth and also confidence because they had played outdoors. And they, this was elementary school children that had taken part in activities in wild places. And so in that article, they made the argument that kids are going to have stronger confidence and self-worth uh, because they're getting time outdoors. Angela Hanscom has a really great TED Talk where she talks about the balance sense. So my understanding is that um, is that we've got this inner ear and we've got to stimulate that through movement. And if we don't, we don't have a strong balance sense. So teachers are telling stories about how children in the classroom have a hard time with spatial awareness, that they bump into each other, bump into things, they fall out of their chair in the middle of class, or they're very easily frustrated. And so this study was done where they looked at the strength of kids, the average strength of kids in 1984, and then um, tried getting kids recently to do the same activities. And what they found is that one in 12 kids can perform at the average for kids in 1984. So their bodies are less strong, they're less prepared to learn, um, and they're not stimulating that inner ear to build even just something as simple as their balance, which helps them pay attention, regulate their emotions, and move their body well. Um, so if you want to learn more, feel free to look into that TED Talk by Angela Hanscom, who I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, but really just as simple as being outdoors helps kids develop this balanced sense that we need for the rest of our lives. And another way that playing outdoors helps with healthy development is that being outdoors provides a challenge. So there's a difference between playing indoors on a surface that's always dry and always feels the same than it is to walk across an uneven log every day. One day it might be windy, another day it might be icy. Uh, there might be another time that there's moss on top of it. And so kids get to learn how to assess risk and figure out how to deal with different types of challenges when they're testing their skills outdoors. And also being outdoors, it helps it stimulates all of the senses, as we all know as gardeners. Um, while you're gardening or while your kid is building a fort, you're going to hear the geese fly overhead. You're going to feel the temperature rise as the sun comes out or decrease as the clouds come in. And so it's really important for, uh, and it's really important and it's even it's essential for healthy childhood development for the physical and emotional health of children to play outdoors, to increase their physical activity, uh, it boosts their, boost their confidence and self-worth, and even uh, reduce their stress, which I know for me that being outdoors reduces my stress. So the recommendation after all of this is that kids should have three hours a day outdoors, and also that this should be free play, things that they just get to come up with on their own. So three hours of free play outdoors a day sounds like a lot of time. And then if we think about it, we spend on average five hours a day on our phones, which seems like a lot of time. And 
I want to encourage you to find ways that outside time can be mixed with ac existing activities. So for example, cooking can be brought outdoors. Commuting can be brought outdoors, whether it's walking somewhere or biking somewhere and exercising can be brought outdoors. So there might be some creative ways to meet that recommendation of three hours of free play outdoors per day. So one question for you to discuss in a small group is what were three of your favorite things to do outside as a child? So just take a moment to share with a couple other people what were three of your favorite things to do outside as a child? Great, so now that you've had a moment to connect with your, your peers and discuss what you liked to do outside, we'll keep going. For me, and this comes from the, the woods and the lake that I grew up near when I was a little kid. I remember building forts with my siblings and also with the neighbor kids. I also really liked eating fresh produce out of the garden, whether it was spinach or raspberries, and have <laughs> memories of uh, coming upon different animals while I was out in the garden. And then also really enjoyed swimming in the lake. So those were just a couple a few things that I liked to do outside as a kid. So now I wanted to jump into some ways that we could cultivate, that we could get kids to play outdoors and get that free play time. So as I mentioned before, there's this natural learning initiative, this really cool project out of North Carolina. And one of the things that they talk about is the importance of pathways and circulation through a space. And so this is a daycare that they redesigned. And if you've ever been to a park that has a loop, you'll probably also find this too, is that people walk the loop and they might go a lot or they might bike or they might have rollerblades, but people will go a lot farther on that loop uh, whether it's at a park or a dog park or somewhere else, then, the, then they will if it's just a straight path. And you'll see in the following video that kids do this too, that riding their trikes, running around, that they'll go much farther on a loop than they will a straight, straight path. So watch this quick video from the Natural Learning Initiative. The looping primary pathway plus patches of shade provides an attractive spine for the outdoor play and learning environment that children with wheels adore. It's kind of magic the way it makes them move. It also provides teachers with a comfortable way to move around the space to keep an eye on children or play with them. Another way that we could redesign spaces is just to simply put more movable parts that uh, kids or even adults have access to in the outdoor play zone. So whether it's sand play, water play, which I guess snow falls into that category, or dirt play. I know some kid zones have a mud kitchen with muffin tins that kids can fill with mud. Um, puddles are a really great thing to explore. Sandboxes are a really simple place where there's movable parts. And also think about other items that kids can move around for different play activities. So sticks, stumps, rocks, things that they can make art with or count with or play with. And one of the cool things about playing outdoors that's different than playing indoors that Angela Hanscom talks about in her book is that inside toys have a specific purpose and they also have rules. So indoors, there might be a little car or a doll and that thing is always a car or is always a doll. Whereas if you go outside, there are fewer 
guidelines and fewer rules. So a stick could be a magic wand, it could be a spoon or a sword. So there's lots of different opportunities with natural objects that don't really exist with indoor play or even with indoor toys. And one of the things that Robin Moore, who's at the Natural Learning Initiative out in North Carolina, that he talks about is how increasing the diversity of plants increases the types of play. And so having pine cones and pine needles that can be played with, whether they're cups or miniature firewood, um, having lots of different types of plants really helps increase the amount of opportunity for playing with things. Um, another way that we can think about redesigning with plants is just to incorporate more edible plants and then also to think about using plants to create spaces. So whether it's a bean trellis or a sunflower house, using some perennial tall grass to make a maze, or even just the shade that a tree casts, there's different ways that plants help us create spaces that might get kids to play outdoors and play a little bit longer with some of these items. So I just want you to make a list of what are some of the fresh herbs, vegetables, and fruit that you could grow that could be just eaten fresh in the garden, things that are easy to pick. So just make a quick list of what are some of the herbs, vegetables, and fruits that could be eaten fresh in the garden. So just a few things that I came up with were cilantro, kale, peas, mint, and juneberries. So those first three are annuals here in Iowa, and then the second two are perennials. So you could think about different types of plants that could be placed in the garden and just easily snatched and, and eaten. Um, I'm, I don't think you're going to eat a lot of mint, but it's just even fun just to have a taste of some of those, some of those herbs or some of those berries. So like I mentioned, the Natural Learning Initiative is focused on improving daycare child center play, play zones. And one question is how we can make better outdoor play spaces. And they've got a bunch of great ideas about how we can use very limited resources to improve play spaces and make it a lot more fun for kids to be out in those areas. So these are some of the elements that are shared. Indoor-outdoor transitions, pathways and circulation, gathering places, arbors, pergolas, trellises, fences and enclosures, sand, water, and dirt play, flower and vegetable gardens, artworks, movable play structures, and also loose parts and play props. And this is a fantastic picture from the Enabling Garden that's created by Polk County Master Gardeners. And you can see some of these elements here. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at different pictures of cool outdoor play places, and you might have a great list of your own, and look at what are some of those elements that are already there from this list? What are some of the elements that are being used in those spaces? So first we have the Brenton Arboretum, which is in Dallas Center, and they have a fantastic natural playground and you can see the tree, the dead tree that kids can climb on. Um, I know that there's a little tunnel that kids can go through. 
So what are some things that you see here from that list uh, at the Brenton Arboretum that are some of those recommended elements? So some things that I see in this picture, I do see loose parts. I see sticks kind of on the right side of the picture where it looks like pieces of bark and sticks are being used to make an enclosed space. And then it looks like the, other than grass, that one of the, the ground surfaces is sand. And so that there could be some sand play in addition to the climbing and fort building that's happening here. So next we've got Jester Park, and this is in Granger in central Iowa. And this is a drawing of the natural playground there. And so one question for you is, what are some of the elements that you see in this sketch of the design of Jester Park that would be great for kids to play outdoors? So some of the things that I see in the middle are water play that kids are encouraged or allowed to, to play in that little pond area. I also see some really strong pathways of where kids can move around the space. And it looks like there's also opportunities for a change in elevation, whether it's climbing up on rocks or climbing up on tunnels. And so it just looks like a really cool space where there's lots of opportunities. And then also going back to that idea of increasing the plant diversity to increase the different types of play, that there's different areas here, whether it's the cattail zone over by this little pond or whether it's this prairie where there's some smaller paths that people can walk on. So it looks like a lot of really cool opportunities for doing different types of play and taking different types of challenges. So this is that picture from the enabling garden in Altoona. And so the question is, what, what are some of the elements that you see here at their natural playground at the enabling garden? Um, oh, and I just wanted to mention that this Polk County Master Gardener Volunteer Project is listed on Des Moines Outdoor Fun as a great natural playscape. And so it's really cool that people in the community know about this as a fantastic outdoor place to play. So what are some elements that, are, that you see here? Some elements that I see, I definitely see some dirt play or some sandbox play with the dump truck in the little sandbox area. Um, I've also, I also see the flower garden that's there with the hydrangeas and then also some loose parts. So over on the right side of the picture, you can see these little natural wood blocks that can be moved around and played with in different ways. And it's really great how they're using plants here to form a little enclosure to this space uh, to, to keep kiddos playing in that sandbox. So what a fantastic Master Gardener volunteer project. This is a picture of Kiwanis Park, which is in Iowa City. So what elements do you see here at this natural playground? So a couple things that I see, I see a lot fewer plants than we saw in the last picture at the enabling garden, but maybe it's also because it looks kind of cold. Um, I do see a pathway going around the area and also these rock walls are forming an enclosed space. So these are just a few outdoor play zones that I've found and hopefully you've got 
something similar or a few of these in your community, um, which are hopefully getting getting kids more excited about playing outdoors and giving them more spaces to do their free play. So one question for you to discuss in your small group is going back to that list, what is one element that could be added to your garden or your volunteer project? So just take a moment to discuss it in a small group. So now that you've taken a, time, a moment to talk about what an element is that you wanna to add to your garden or volunteer project, I wanted to talk about some other ways to engage youth in more free play outdoors and maybe some other ways to think about the role of youth in this. So one would be to, if you do have a project that's focused on designing a space, is to make sure that youth are part of that process so they can share some of their ideas. So a small way that they could be involved in a redesign would be to help choose which seeds to plant or which trees that you're going to plant. Medium level would be have them help build something. Maybe it's a bean trellis like that's in this picture or some other project. And then a big way to engage youth would be help them plan where where to put the maze, where to put the trellis, where to put the path. Um, so this could be on paper, giving them tools so that they could help to decide where things are going to go. One thing that I found, so I mentioned that I created a gardening and cooking program for youth, for teenagers a while back. And one of the things that I was surprised by and hadn't anticipated was how the teenagers took the skills that I was teaching them, whether it was weeding or harvesting or cooking, and they very quickly came up with jobs. They were entrepreneurs. And so one of them started mowing lawns, another one started pulling weeds, one of them started a large vegetable garden that they then started selling at the farmer's market. And so that's one other thing to think about when engaging youth in outdoor activities is that they might be interested in making a couple dollars and that it's really great to, to build their skills that they could use for a job, um, whether currently or in the future. So there's this really great resource called Niche, which is the National Initiative for Consumer Horticulture. And recently they put out some infographics, some research about why plants should be brought into schools. And so maybe you're thinking that would be a simple win would be to get more houseplants, indoor plants into the schools. So just to keep a, a few facts from the National Initiative for Consumer Horticulture is that classrooms that had plants had increased test scores. The kids had, the youth had fewer sick days and the youth were also misbehaving less. And we know that there are other benefits of houseplants in terms of calming us and also cleaning the air, making the air in a room fresher and safer. Maybe that's another way to engage youth is uh, to get the kids to go outdoors more and then also maybe find a way to bring plants indoors. Another way that you could engage youth and also bring plants indoors or do this outside is just to find some really simple recipes, things that kids could memorize the ingredients for, and to make them just to have fun with plants. Uh, what I found is that youth are much more willing to try 
fruits and vegetables that they've had a hand in helping to grow, whether it's as simple as picking them or whether they really did plant those and, and tend to them. So just a few simple ways to show kids how to, how to have fun with those plants with cooking would be to put edible flowers in an ice cube tray uh, to make a really simple salad, make some sun tea. Maybe that's with some herbs or other things that you can find out in the garden. And also smoothies are another simple way to use plants from the garden. So another way to engage youth in getting them excited about plants, and this can be done indoors or outdoors, is to find some fantastic books that are about gardening or about plants. This list is from this website that's provided here. So some great ones, Rainbow Stew, Green Green, A Community Gardening Story, Lola Plants a Garden, Green is a Chili Pepper. So books are a great way to get kids excited about the garden also. And as you all know, there are so many different ways to have fun with plants just by making simple art projects. And one book that I found is called The Book of Gardening Projects for Kids, which has a lot of cool art projects and even recipes and science experiments. So whether it's doing some flower pounding making a seed mosaic, or writing poems about plants. There are lots of different ways to make some, make some art with the plants. So I wanted to share a few ideas, and I'm sure you've got a lot of great ideas also, about how Master Gardener volunteers can get kids to play outdoors some more. So just a little bit about the Iowa Master Gardener program. The program has been around for over 40 years, and each year we have about 2,000 active Master Gardener volunteers, and these volunteers are doing really amazing things in their community. And to become a Master Gardener volunteer, people go through the 40-hour Master Gardener training which is offered each fall. And it's really fun because you get to do hands-on learning about plants and insects, and also get to visit some places where Master Gardener volunteers are making a difference in their community. And one of the ways that we celebrate Master Gardeners and the difference that they are making, the impact that they're having on their community, is that we have this award called Search for Excellence. And so applications are due March 15th of each year, and it's a way to showcase Master Gardener volunteer group projects that are really doing fantastic things in the community. And I do want to point out that many of the previous Search for Excellence award winners were, for, were given to projects that were engaging youth in the outdoors. So these were beautification projects that teenagers were involved with, cultivating vegetable gardens with youth, and even creating a historical garden project which, with 4-H youth. So lots of different ways to make a difference in your community, and one of those ways could be as a Master Gardener volunteer. So one recommendation would be to make Master Gardener volunteer projects more kid-friendly. So this is another picture from the enabling garden. It looks like there's a little tic-tac-toe game on that table with stones. And you can see benches and other things in the area. So this is a really kid-friendly garden. So one, one is to think about the events that you put on, because I do know that Master Gardener volunteers do put on events for youth. Think about the time of day. Ask people in your community, what time is a good time to offer something for kids? And also at the events, allow kids to explore. Allow them to move things around, pick flowers, or do other types of projects. Another thing to think about is 
the projects themselves, the sites. So maybe you could add a free play zone. Maybe you could put in some small tools in an area where kids are allowed to just dig or haul things around in a little wheelbarrow. Uh, dirt and water play areas can be really simple and super fun. So maybe there's parts of your site that kids can get involved with. And one thing that I've learned from wildlife biologists is that wildlife really like it messy. And for us as gardeners, sometimes we don't want things to be super messy, but kids, kids might enjoy a more messy zone and the wildlife will too, so that's good. And then also think about volunteer opportunities. Can volunteers bring children to the volunteer site? And are Master Gardener volunteer meetings and workshops kid-friendly? There are really simple ways that we can make it easier to get kids involved in some of this stuff. And what, what a great thing. I know we've all got memories of mentors in our life who helped us with gardening. It's a, a tactile project, and so why not let kids engage in such a cool thing. So one other idea would be to think about using Master Gardener volunteer time to support some redesign of spaces. So we've already talked about something as simple as adding more plant diversity and then also redesigning play spaces. So maybe it starts with building partnerships, reaching out to community leaders, who are interested in public health or maybe interested in the outdoors. And there are lots of different venues that have outdoor spaces that could be made better for kid play. So maybe it's a daycare, a library, a school, a place of worship. See if one of these places would like help with either adding more plant diversity or improving their outdoor play areas. So one of the resources for you is called the Natural Learning Initiative Green Desk, which I wanted to show to you real fast. So the Green Desk is a really fantastic website if you want to take a look at some different simple, affordable ideas. And so you can search through this or just click on different pieces. So I see planning and planting, edible plants for play and learning, landscape plant list, landscape plants for play and learning. So lots of ideas about different types of plants and then also just different ways of adding elements to the landscape. And many of these are inexpensive. So this green desk at the Natural Learning Initiative is a really cool resource for you. And then I just quickly wanted to play another video from the Natural Learning Initiative that just talks about how this takes time, as we all know as gardeners, that it really takes time to make these spaces better. It doesn't really happen overnight. So please take a look at this video about incremental design. High quality outdoor learning environments do not happen overnight, but usually over several years. As resources become available, as volunteers get interested, as funders are convinced, and as teachers become trained and excited. Implementation is guided by a master plan, but more importantly, it is a learning process for all involved. We call this incremental development. I wanted to thank you all for connecting today and thinking about how we can get youth outdoors more. I know it sounds daunting when we think about what we're up against in terms of how easy it is for kids not to go outdoors. And yeah, I just want to thank you all for thinking about ways to get youth out outdoors because we know that it's really good for our health and it's really good for their health. And so if we can find more ways to get kids excited and spending more time outdoors, I think we're all going to be better off. And it was such a pleasure when I was making this presentation to find that 
These are things that Master Gardener volunteers are already doing, which is what I always find, is that if there's a cool idea out there, Master Gardener volunteers are probably doing it. So thank you so much if you are a Master Gardener volunteer. And if you aren't, please feel free to reach out to your county Iowa State University Extension and Outreach Program to find out when the next Master Gardener training will be offered. So again, thank you so much for your time today.